We also have um, other types of corals, these uh, organ pipe corals, blue corals, and fire corals, all also, even though they're not skeletonian corals, they also do produce a hard skeleton. So they're in this weird group of non-stony, stony corals. But but the, the key for me is anything that this that produces a hard skeleton, it can be preserved in the fossil record. And then I can use these to look at corals in the past. And so so I mostly focus on skeletonian, but anything that does produce a skeleton, I also look at. We do see a lot of these fire corals and blue corals and organ pipe corals in our fossil samples. And so what's also interesting about corals is the majority of them have a photosynthetic algae that they live in symbiosis with. Uh, this algae produces energy from the sun through photosynthesis. And actually in many cases, it actually transfers up to 90% of its uh, energy produced this way to the coral. In return, the coral gives the algae a nice safe home, as well as it allows, because the coral will continuously grow as the sea level rises. So it allows the algae to stay in the photosensitive range where they can still get sunlight to produce food. Um, so what's also really interesting is we can see, uh, this is a lovely photo where you can see this is a, a polyps of a, or the tentacles of a polyp, and you can see that the actual coral polyp itself is clear. The, the tissue of the live coral is clear to bilky. And what we're seeing, all these little dots, are these, these are the symbiotic algae that they live in them. And so these algae are actually what give corals their beautiful colors. Almost all corals are clear to milky tissue. And so if we didn't have these algae, all you'd see is white because you'd have the clear tissue on top of the white calcium carbonate skeleton. And that's what well, we'll talk about a bit later, but that's actually also what leads to bleaching is, is you lose these algae and suddenly all you can see is the, the white skeleton through the coral tissue. But so this is also a part of the good reason why corals have a limited range. So they live in the tropics to subtropics. Uh, they tend to live in water depths of 30 meters or less. They have a very small ambient temperature range, usually in the 20 to 30 degrees Celsius range and other factors. And a lot of that's it's limited on the fact that uh, these corals are dependent on these photosynthetic algae. So that really kind of limits their, their range of environment. And then this is a little bit talking about different growth forms. Corals grow in many different ways. Uh, so as an example, we have these branching corals. They grow much like you'd see like tree branches or like deer antlers. In fact, there's corals called staghorn corals and, and alcohol corals because they look quite similar to these antlers. Uh, but what, so they can grow really fast. That's the beauty of these, these branching corals is they're able to go really fast, but then they're also very sensitive to environmental changes. You change the water temperature by one or two degrees and they cannot handle that because the fast growing metabolism of these corals requires a very specific environment. Uh, similarly, we have these massive corals, which tend to grow um, in shallower depths along the reef base, but also along a reef crest, where we get a lot of wave energy because they're large and massive. These are the slow growing ones that get to be four or five meters across that could be hundreds of years old. And so while they're much more slower growing, it also means that they're a lot less sensitive to environmental changes. Because they grow so slow and they use a lot less energy to do that, they can adapt to a changing environment much more readily than a branching coral does. But then, of course, these rare forms also tell us other things. So you get a lot of foliaceous and laminar. Uh, encrusting corals grow over top of the surface of a rock or other pre-existing hard surface. And these kind of all have pros and cons to their, their life form. Um, we also have free living corals, which it's a bit of a misnomer. While most corals are attached to the seafloor, free living corals aren't directly attached. What they do is they just sit loosely on the floor and they technically can move, but they don't actually move through their own means. They move just by rolling around with the wave energy. So it's while they're called free living, they're still basically a coral that's relying on being on the surface of the ocean floor. And so then this figure here shows uh, the, the range of coral diversity. So we see that in a lot of the, the Caribbean is maybe 100 to 200 species of corals. Uh, most same with the Mediterranean, there's almost no corals left um, you know, across most of the Atlantic. But then we start to get to the Indo-Pacific region, we start to see you know, lots more coral species. And what we have right here in the middle of Indonesia, the Philippines, and uh, of Malaysia, a little bit on the Borneo, we have what's called the Coral Triangle. So it's an area that has over 600 known species of coral, uh, which also includes South Sulawesi, which is where I do my work. And that's why it's actually quite important that I focus on this area is because while this is the most diverse area of coral species, as well as it is an area of really high and rapid coral growth, we don't have a lot of historical records, only, only since basically colonial um, times with the Dutch and the English and, and the Portuguese being in the area. And even then, they're not very thorough records. So it's an area that's important to study better, but we don't know a lot about what happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, so now we're just also going to kind of define a few terms. I've already talked about the reef crest, uh, but what the reef crest is, you can see on the side profile, this is all reef limestone or calcium carbonate. The reef crest is the part of the reef that reaches the maximum, basically right up to sometimes even 
coming out of the sea level. And this is the part that breaks the waves. It takes a lot of that wave energy and with the, the branching corals, especially in this area, they tend to baffle the waves and they can reduce wave energy. And behind that, we have the inner reef or the reef flat, where obviously water tends to be more shallower, maybe one to a few meters water depth, but usually one or two, not much more going towards the shore. And of course, on the other side of the reef crest is the outer reef, or uh, I call it the reef slope. Full reef also is applicable, but same thing. This is where the reef goes from the crest down towards the ocean floor until it can no longer handle a coral at that moment. And then, so this is kind of uh, some of the different reefs, right? So we have, obviously you've got like mainland and you've got a fringing reef, which grows along the coastline. Uh, you have patch reefs, which grow just kind of along the shelf there. Uh, we're all quite familiar with the term barrier reef, thanks to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia or the Belize Barrier Reef. Uh, these reefs are large reefs that grow on the edge of the shelf or around a, a, an island and therefore cause a nice barrier protecting this whole large patch of um, water behind it or in this case where it's growing around the island. Uh, and another type we have is an atoll. So an atoll is basically an island that grows out and you have a barrier infringing reef that grows around it. And then the island will either start to erode or subsidize. And as that does that, you're left with the lagoon in the middle of what's called an atoll. So these are just different types of reef formations that you can see the most common ones. And then while we're on the topic of reef formation, of course, it's also important that we talk about carbon producers in general. I mean, coral reefs themselves, corals are the, one of the largest contributors, contributors of calcium carbonate production or limestone production on a reef. I mean, in many reefs, it's 50, 60, 70% of the, the carbonate production is from corals. But they're not the only organism that produces a hard skeleton with carbonate. We have mollusks, so things like snails and clams. Uh, they also grow up large shells. In fact, this is a giant clam, a tridactin, which can grow up to uh, one or two meters across. So it can still grow very large. Uh, carbon structures themselves, which also contributes to the reef growth. Uh, similarly, we have calcareous algae. This is a red algae and a green algae, and both of them are calcareous. They, again, also produce a carbonate structure that helps give them uh, skeleton or support. Of course, we also have microscopic organisms. These are called foraminiferas or forams. Uh, they're single-celled organisms, basically a type of plankton that grows either on in the water column or uh, these ones especially grow along the reef of the certain ocean floor. They tend to grow a lot, especially all coral reefs have different forams associated with them. And so we just see that, that while cor corals are one of the most important carbon producers, there's a lot more that it goes into producing carbon. And so to grow a reef, it's all about net carbon in production. If you produce more carbon than you are losing, I okay, through erosion, erosion can be either by wave action, by things like boat anchors and, and trawling, uh, or by acid ocean acidification, or actually the most common form of grazing is by, or sorry, erosion is by grazing. So like this parrotfish or sea urchins, they eat away at the algae that grows on corals, but in the process, they also scrape away part of the coral. And so they erode the coral that way. So for a reef to grow, it just has to have more carbonate production than it does erosion. And that, that'll allow it to grow. And so this is also kind of, we'll talk a little bit about reef formation a little bit more here. So, um, because geologists and biologists aren't very creative, we have basically three types of reef growth. We've got keep up, catch up, and give up. And the names pretty much explain exactly what they are. So keep up phase is where uh, the reef is growing at rates equal to or faster than sea level rise at the time in that area. Uh, it tends to be dominated by branching corals, basically, or other types of shallow water corals like laminar corals as well. And basically the whole way is the reef is keeping up a sea level rise quite easily. In fact, some cases you can even see it outgrows it. There's no more room for it to grow vertically, so it can only grow horizontally. Uh, this is the most ideal situation if a coral can keep up with sea level rise and it's no issue at all. And then of course we have a catch up phase where it goes from, uh, from sh deeper to shallower within the, the reef section. So what you have is more massive corals, it's more at the base of the reef. And see the, while the coral is growing, it's not growing quite as fast as sea level rise. It's growing a little bit slower, especially in the beginning period. So what you then have is a shift from the massive deeper water to the, the shallower um, branching corals that we see. And so it's, it's called a catch-up phase because it has to keep up with sea level as much as possible. And it's trying to catch up, but not get overgrown and overtaken by sea level rise. And of course, finally, we have a give up phase. Uh, basically what that is is where sea level goes way too fast and the reef just cannot keep up with it. Suddenly it's it's too deep and no longer can get the adequate light it needs for its symbionts. It can no longer therefore get its food production and therefore can't grow. And so what ends up happening then is you have a reef just stops 
and other becomes a relic reef, or another fun term is a uh, drowned reef, where it's a bit of a misnomer because the coral reefs live underwater, but it is a drowned reef because it's so deep it no longer can support coral growth. And so I've already kind of mentioned reef accretion a little bit, but um, so what we're talking about when we talk about reef accretion is, is the rate of a reef total, not just corals, but the entire reef to grow. And so we can see that reef accretion is mostly composed of coral growth, but it also, you can see there's a bit of a gap, which means there's other things filling in this, this rate of uh, accretion. And so some of these things are other carpet production, like we talked about from mollusks and forams, uh, sediment infilling, if you get a lot of sediment from, from a runoff from a river or a rain event that brings a lot of sediment in, that also infills from, from the land. Uh, silica production from animals like sponges and, and siliceous plankton that also can contribute. We have cores from Panama that's up to 10% silica on the reef. So, so it, all these other things make up that difference. But again, coral growth is the majority of reef accretion. And so basically you can see that you know, there's a variation, but basically coral reefs grow on average between five and 10 millimeters per year, uh, most closer to five millimeters. But as long as they're in this five to 10 millimeter range, they're within the uh, keep up range and they're just the catch up keep up range. So as long as it's, it's only when they start to uh, create at rates slower than five millimeters that we really become worried. And a lot of this is due to the fact that accretion is linked to water depth in general. So, so water depth means that there's a certain amount of light levels and temperature which corals need to grow. But the big one actually is also accommodation space. So sea level rise in small amounts is actually useful for corals because if there's no more room for a coral to grow, then it can't grow, it has to stop growing. Whereas with a small incremental amount of sea level rise, it creates a little bit more room for a reef to grow vertically. And then so the reef can then continue to grow upwards. And then on the right here is just a demonstration of what I mean by accretion rate. So, so you've got a point, whether it's on a fossil reef that's on land, or you take a, a reef core, or, or you just use a coral and you measure within the coral, but you take two known points, you take the age of those two points, and you take the depth, you subtract the difference of the depth and divide it by the difference of the time, and you understand. So if this is a meter and this is a thousand years, and it's growing one millimeter per year or one meter per thousand years. And then another term we'll talk about a little bit um, is turbid versus clear water reefs. And the majority of reefs in the world are clear water. They grow in you know, this blue, pristine water, and all those beautiful pictures you see are from. Um, you know, like tourism and, and dive shop packages. But we do have some turbid reefs. And what turbid reefs are, are reefs that are more affected by things like freshwater sediments and nutrient runoff. They tend to be closer to shore. They can either be natural in areas like the GBR. They have some uh, turbid reefs that are caused by all the large river flow from on the mainland Australia to the PBR. But then in areas like Singapore, where we have man-made turbid reefs, because the island's been basically clear-cut and turned into a whole big city, so there's a lot more runoff and sedimentation coming off caused by man-made processes. But basically what it is is, so you get all these nutrients and sediments, they run into the water, and the water becomes brown water as opposed to clear water. And while most, like I said, most reefs classify as clear water, 15% of reefs globally are currently turbid. But this is interesting because in the future, it's actually likely that we might see more turbid reefs. Of course, with more clear cutting for construction and agriculture that we see, we're get, gonna get a lot more runoff, which will cause a lot more turbid zones. Uh, as well as what we're actually seeing is turbidity, while it is a harsh, not quite harsh, but while it's a difficult environment to live in compared to the clear water, not every coral can handle it. Certain corals can't grow there. But what we do get there is corals that are very sturdy, corals that can handle more, a larger range of temperatures, a larger range of sedimentation, like more or less UV, as well as the sediment in the water actually helps to filter out some of the UV light and actually shades corals. So, so what we're actually seeing is that um, corals in the, the turbid zones can grow just as fast and sometimes even faster than clear water corals. So this could be an area in the future where we see a lot more corals that are able to thrive in future climate change scenarios. So we now kind of understand what a coral is and how it forms a reef. So well, why are they important? Well, of course, as you can see, there's obviously a monetary value. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars globally every year uh, based on things like food production and tourism. Of course, tourism is a big one, right? We have lots of tourism in areas like I mean, Hawaii, in Indonesia, all these areas, uh, Costa Rica, they depend highly on tourism and they depend on beautiful reefs, dive shops, snorkeling, these kinds of things. Uh, but more importantly, food production. Uh, we, as you can see, is well-managed well reefs produce tons, literally tons of food per year per kilometer square. In fact, it's actually important for fish. A lot of fish, even like tuna and like larger fish that live in the open water, they, they're juvenile when they're young, they actually live closer to these 
other seagrass beds or coral reefs where they, they can hide and, and then grow to be large enough to go out free swimming. And so even though if you catch a reef far out in the open ocean, it might have actually still depended on the coral reef as part of its lifespan. So they're very super important for food production. Uh, medicine, of course, is another big one. I actually have a colleague who works on, on medicinal products from marine sponges. Well, so what we find is we have a lot of new cancer drugs, especially, are being found from, from corals and from marine sponges and other marine products. Uh, but also other many things like um, there's herpes aids, there's all sorts of um, supplements that are being found in like different medicines that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And I merely mean just starting to scratch the surface of. So there's a lot to be said there as well. And then of course, biodiversity, right? So we talked about if corals are diverse. Well, coral reefs themselves cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, but they're home to over 25% of all marine species, not just fish. This is actually a little bit of a misprint, but it's actually all marine species. So for something that covers a little of the Earth's surface, it harbors a large amount of diversity. And aside from climate change, we actually are also in a bit of a biodiversity crisis where we're losing biodiversity quite rapidly. And this is important because obviously ecosystems are very interconnected. So if you start to lose all that biodiversity, you could have ecosystem collapses and other sorts of issues. But also just in terms of, of evolution and genetics, right? That if you, if you have smaller populations and smaller species varieties, then you're gonna have a lot more issues with future evolution of, of different organisms. So I don't talk a lot about the biodiversity crisis because it's not the exact part of my, of my work. I work mostly on climate change and coral reefs, but it's still a very important issue to note and it's something that we need to deal with moving forward in the future. Um, but yeah, so as we see, the coral reefs are important. So just, I want to kind of end this a little bit with, um, we'll talk about coastal protection more on the next slide, but I want to end with a quote from the legendary Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is like a marine research goddess, if you're familiar with her, uh, who once said that no water, no life, no blue, no green, which really just impacts how important not just the ocean but specifically reefs are for all of us every one of us that lives on this planet and of course like i said another benefit of, of coral reefs is coastal protection uh, a healthy and thriving coral reef is a better artificial or better than any artificial seawall or wave break that we've ever produced through construction means what it does like i said is you you have it dissipates up to 97 percent of the wave energy of waves and also protects from coastlines from storms and flooding especially in conjunction with mangroves, which is another important ecosystem. Um, but also if you have a healthy coral reef, it regenerates, it's self-regenerating. So you, unlike a, a man-made seawall, you don't have to go out and do repairs. You don't have to go out and do maintenance. You don't have to do cleaning. You don't have to do all these things. The coral reef will take care of itself if it's healthy. Every time there's a big storm or a big wave, it'll, it'll regenerate and regrow corals on top of what got broken off. And it'll keep the coastline healthy and protected for forever as long as it's healthy. So we've also now talked about the benefits, but we need to start to talk about the threats. This is a talk about corals and climate change. So obviously one of the biggest coral reef threats in the world is climate change and for many reasons. Uh, with climate change, we're seeing increasing temperatures, we're seeing increasing CO2 levels and those have different impacts in different ways. Obviously warming ocean temperatures and coral bleaching is a big issue. Sea level rise, we've kind of already touched upon, but if sea level rise is too fast, Obviously, then corals can't keep up, as well as sea level rise will also increase sedimentation and run off from the mainland. Of course, we're starting to see stronger, more frequent storms, uh, which normally, like I said, corals can regenerate, but the more frequently the stronger they are, the harder it is because corals do take time to grow. Even the fastest growing coral only grows millimeters you know, per year, right? So what you really need is, is, is for these storms, if they're happening more frequently, then they're gonna impact how fast corals can recover. Uh, as well as another big one is ocean acidification. This has to do with CO2 absorption, but obviously uh, calcium carbonate and acids don't mix. And we'll talk a little bit about that further. And of course, there's other things as well, like I said, increased runoff, um, currents, we're seeing disease outbreaks, there's all sorts of things. So we'll kind of go over a few of them here. So this is a big one, a famous one. Um, this actually is a, a famous shot from the Netflix documentary, Chasing Coral. If you have not seen the coral or that documentary, on Chasing Coral, I really highly recommend. It's an amazingly well done documentary where what they do is they really show the effects of coral bleaching. Um, it's this company that did these like reef view surveys that people could use like Google Maps, but for reefs. And so this is American Samoa as an example, this picture. And these pictures are taken only a few months apart. They were there in 2015 and then, or sorry, 2014. And then they came back in early 2015 because they heard that there's bleaching. And you can see what was once a healthy reef is all completely bleached on a single piece of coral escaped that bleaching event. And actually 2015, 2016, has been the worst bleaching event ever on record. It, it took out almost half of corals globally. They all bleach. So 
So yeah, like I said, it, it's a really great documentary, Chasing Coral. If you haven't seen it, it, it does explain coral bleaching quite better than I ever really could. But we will take a shot at that. So coral bleaching is a stress response. We talked about how these corals have these symbiotic algae within their tissue that produce food. But as the coral starts to get stressed, usually through increased temperature or increased UV, aka increased sunlight, but there are other factors that can also can stress corals. But what they do is, and these corals start to, the algae produces too much and it becomes a, a burden on the corals. So instead of being helpful, now it's becoming an issue. And the coral can no longer maintain the algae while keeping itself alive. So what it does is it expels these algae. And some of these beautiful colored corals lose the one thing that gives them color, which is these algae. And what you're left with is just that clear coral tissue over top of the white skeleton. And so that's why it appears to be white or bleach. These corals can recover. They'll bring back their algae as soon as the conditions are less stressful for them. But again, much like we're talking about the storms, the more frequent and the more stronger these events are, the harder it is to recover because recovery can take months to years for them to get back all of their algae. So if you start having coral bleaching events uh, that are really strong every year or two, then it becomes a lot harder for some corals to recover. Ocean acidification is another important issue that we're seeing from climate change. As I say, as we produce a lot of CO2 and with temperatures that increase, CO2 gets absorbed more readily into the ocean. And when CO2 reacts with water, H2O, it becomes a type of acid, a carbonic acid. And as these corals build their skeletons on a calcium carbonate, which is a substance which is, reacts with acids, what you then have is an issue because not only do you have current coral skeleton being slightly dissolved by the acid, which makes the coral weaker, more likely to break off, more likely to die, but also if CO2 levels and carbonic acid levels are really high in the ocean, it actually will prevent corals from being able to grow calcium carbonate completely. Um, there's been experiments people have done in tanks where they put as much acid into the water as they could and, and corals couldn't even grow their skeletons. They couldn't grow past their, their beginning juvenile stage because they couldn't build these skeletons. So it's kind of a double whammy ocean acidification on, on coral growth and it's a big issue for them. It makes it very difficult to accomplish to grow their calcium carbonate skeletons. We've already seen this figure, but again, we're just going to again talk about sea level rise. So sea level rise is another big issue, like I said, um, as long as corals can keep up catch up with, with you know, levels of sea level rise that we've seen in the past and that we're just seeing currently in the present, corals are able to keep up with those. But we also have seen with the IPCC reports and other sorts of future forecast modeling, some of the worst scenarios sea level rise could actually be so fast that corals would be struggling to catch up, much less not even keeping up. So, so as long as sea level doesn't hit extremes, corals should be able to cope with the future. But of course, like I say, it, that all depends on how we deal with things in the next 10, 20 years because if sea level rise becomes too drastically fast and corals will have troubles that way as well. Uh, destructive fishing is another big issue for coral reefs. Uh, so actually right here's an example of what's called blast fishing or dynamite fishing. So what these guys do is these fishermen take a homemade bomb and they throw it in the ocean and then when it goes off, it shocks and kills as many fish at once as possible. And then they collect all the dead fish that float to the surface or they free dive down and grab the rest. But as the name would, probably imply a dynamite fishing or blast fishing. This bomb also destroys corals, of course, and other any other organism, the shockwave. I mean, when I, so this is, this is, when I talk about how we didn't have any large fish in the area that I work, it's because of this. There's tons of blast fishing and also lots of other destructive fishing practices. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of an issue because while it's being an impact on the ecosystem, it's also a socioeconomic issue. And these people can only survive by fishing and selling the fish to these I tell you, usually to China, Singapore, Hong Kong, these kind of places, they don't even keep the fish for themselves to eat. They're just trying to make a little bit of money to survive. So it's not an easy problem to solve, but it's one that needs to be solved. Uh, and even when I was diving in Indonesia, you could feel these bombs go off. You just hear it, boom. And sometimes if you're close enough, you can feel the pressure wave on your heart. And, it's, and if I can feel the pressure wave from, you know, hundreds of like tens to hundreds of meters away, imagine what it feels like right up and close. So it's quite destructive to these reefs. Uh, they also, some people do try cyanide fishing, which is a type of poison. So they put a poison in the reef and again, it kills the fish and then they, they collect the fish. But of course, poison also impacts all living creatures, including the corals. And then there's other types of destructive fishing as well. So trawling is a big one where we're drag, drag trawling, where you're dragging nets across the seafloor. It rips out corals. Uh, it kicks up a bunch of sediment and smothers corals that way by burying them in, in sediment from the trawling. And then also what we have here, this is a picture of a ghost net that's been washed up onto a reef. Uh, ghost nets are just reefs or nets that have been abandoned and same thing you have ghost lines but that have been abandoned they wash up under the reef and they get stuck so not only is it breaking off the reef by like dragging along it but you can see a lot of this coral is now underneath this um, 
net, which is also growing algae, and it's how it's becoming smothered. It can't get daylight, so it can't use the photosynthetic algae to produce food. It's also having trouble breathing. Um, so it's quite destructive, these ghost nets, when they end up on, on reefs. And it's important to note because out of all ocean plastic waste, over two thirds of it is discarded fishing gear. So that's a major problem, specifically not just for coral reefs, but also the microplastic problem in the ocean. A lot of it has to do with this, this fishing gear. Uh, and then of course, the sediment nutrient runoff is another big issue. Clear cutting of land for agriculture, construction and other things, as well as pollutants from, from um, both from pollutants from like factories and production, as well as pollutants from just, you know, human waste from toilets and stuff. Some toilets, especially in these smaller third world countries go straight into the ocean without any filtering or waste management at all. Uh, so these kinds of things, these in kind of increased sedimentation and pollution and, and nutrient runoff cause all sorts of issues. Uh, we see, I did a lot of work in, in fossil reefs in the Caribbean and Panama. We see that even only 100, 200 years ago, there's already clear noted increase in sedimentation from the banana plantations where they did clear cutting. And you can even see that in the fossil record that there's, there's an impact from the agriculture from 100, 200 years ago. Of course, pollutants also can cause diseases. Um, and then of course, the nutrients and sediments, not only, like I said, they create turbid zones, they can smother and bury reefs, uh, but also they can create algal blooms and these algal blooms can also create issues by creating a hypoxia, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide here, which is another big issue. So hypoxia is when you have low oxygen levels in a reef, usually on the deeper part, the slope. Uh, what happens is, like I so said, you get these algal blooms and these algal blooms are so crazy with the sediments and the nutrients from the runoff that they can grow unchecked, unrampant, and they use up all the oxygen in the water. And of course, every living thing on this planet needs oxygen to survive in some way or another. So as you reduce the oxygen, you start to suffocate animals, right? So you'll start to see fish swimming towards the surface or basically, eventually, if it's severe enough, you'll have mortality of corals, of crustaceans, of, of fish, everything. Um, but even if you don't get the worst case scenario, low oxygen levels are known to prompt bleaching because it's, again, a stress response. And obviously, as a human, if you were running out of air, you'd also be quite stressed and you have stress responses, as well as it makes corals more susceptible to diseases. Uh, like I said, but the big thing is it can just lead to mass mortality through pure smothering, pure basically through suffocation. And of course, there's another issue that we're starting to find is um, uh, coral diseases. So this is just one example. It's the stony coral tissue loss disease. It's quite prevalent in the Caribbean actually right now. And you can see it covers a whole range of species. Uh, these diseases are not fully understood. Um, we're still trying to figure out the, the cause of it. But what we do know is most of these are caused by either a bacterial or a fungal infection, much like how we get sick from those kinds of things in, in humans. Uh, but again, we're still not fully sure of the mechanisms, which makes it hard to treat. The only thing that we know that for sure that works is by putting on an antifungal, antibacterial cream, but then you have to use it on every single disease coral. And that's a large undertaking that costs lots of money. So, so right now we don't have a very good way of dealing with um, coral diseases, but it's something that we're gonna to need to get a handle on in the future, because like I said, not only are they a problem on their own, but as a coral becomes more stressed and weak from uh, whether it's hypoxia or sedimentation or bleaching, it's more susceptible to diseases, much like as when you're already run down, you're exhausted, you're stressed, you're more likely to get sick as a human. So I'll kind of end the first part with this. So the present is the key to the past. It's a very famous geology saying, but what it just means is we can look at stuff in the present day. We can look at animals. We can look at how they behave, how they act, how they grow, how they evolve. We can look at river systems and reef systems, how they grow in the present day. And then we can apply that to the past and understand how things happen in the past. But I also would equally argue that it, the past is the key to the future. Uh, by looking at how reefs have changed and other things have changed in the past and how they've adapted. I mean, reefs have been around millions of years. They've seen climate change. They've seen high temperatures. They've seen high level sea rise scenarios, even only a few thousand years ago, temperatures were higher and sea levels were higher. Um, you know, so it's it's important to look at these things in the past and see how they evolved, adapted, and overcame these challenges. And then we can start to understand how corals may or may not be able to handle this in the future. And if so, which ones and how they'll be able to adapt. So this picture is, uh, again, taking a year apart, the 2015-2016 bleaching event, like I said, it was a bad one. This is Christmas Island, uh, just southwest of Indonesia. And then in a the year, the entire reef is dead and completely overgrown by algae. Um, but so we can also look in the past and see these things. Sometimes we can catch these sorts of mass mortality events in the past. We see we see a healthy reef, healthy reef, and suddenly there's no more corals. And so we can catch these in the past and we can start to figure out, well, we know that if the temperature was higher, maybe it was a temperature-related mass mortality or bleaching mass mortality, and these kinds of things. 
So that brings me into part two of the talk, which is the real coral reef time machine part. This is my current work that I've been doing in uh, Spermond Archipelago, which is South Sulawesi. And Sulawesi is an island dead center in Indonesia. Uh, it's right in the middle of that coral triangle that we talked about earlier. So what I look at is I look at the reefs through, through the last few thousand years, uh, basically pre-humans to humans, and trying to see what happened and how these reefs have changed and, and what's driving these changes. And more specifically in the terms of these are reef islands, so how do these reef islands grow? So this is the Spermonda Archipelago. Uh, this is the mainland here, the coastline. This is Makassar is a big city of a few million people. And then of course you can see this is a big shelf. Uh, we've got a bit of a, not quite a full barrier reef, but a Apache barrier reef on the outside. And then we have these chains of islands over, you know, hundreds of islands. And all of these islands are coral reef islands. So they're formed by coral reefs growing to a point where they emerged from the surface of the water and became an island. So we, we did samples from two islands, Samalona, which is nearer to shore. It's this island here on the bottom. Uh, you can see there's two rivers here, two big rivers, which put out a lot of sediment and nutrients. And so this reef sees a lot more turbidity. It's in the turbid zone. And then with the other island we took course from is Puringaran Keke, which is a little bit further out. And you can see the island is a little bit different, right? Um, and so it sees more wave energy domination as opposed to, to turbidity. Uh, it's, so it's more driven by the changes of the water. And the, the wave, dominant wave energy is from west to east. And we can kind of see the same thing. All the islands are on the east side of the platform. So how did we do this? Well, so we took reef cores. Much like a geology you would do for, for oil sampling or for any other type of geology, we took a six meter long aluminum tube and we just hammered it into the reef. Uh, so this is us in the reef flat, the area behind the reef crest. And you can see uh, we have a step ladder and we're standing, the water's only about a meter deep, but we're, we're putting the cores in and you get a lot of really good fun looks. There's some local tourists. You can see the boats in the background. You get a lot of fun looks and questions. Mostly specifically, what are you guys doing? And our favorite answer was to say that we were uh, searching for fresh water because it always threw them for a good loop, right? Because obviously we're standing in the middle of the ocean, so where would we find fresh water? But, but the idea is, you can see, because as we talk about how a reef grows vertically, so we capture all these layers of time of growth by putting this pipe in vertically, and we can see how the reef has changed from the modern to thousands of years ago. Uh, we also took cores from the reef slope, deeper water, where we do scuba, as you can see. Uh, and I mean, the first video didn't make it look so difficult, but this video you can really see, it's actually probably the best workout I've ever done. After two years of COVID, it was a well-needed workout program. I came back from Indonesia, tan and in shapes as my girlfriend, and I probably haven't been as tan or in shape since. So if you really need to lose some weight, come join me on a coring program. We'll, we'll take care of that. But once you're done hammering the core in, then what you have to do is, Sometimes you just cannot core any further. I mean, obviously in an ideal world, we put six meters of pipe in every single time, but of course, sometimes you hit large coral heads and, and you hit large patches of cement and you just can't go any further. When that's the case, you cut off the top of the, the tube, you cap it, duct tape it really well. And then what this does is it creates a vacuum seal. And now that you've got a vacuum seal, so as you start to pull the core up, everything that you have inside the core will come with it. And so after you seal it, then you get this, you get brute force just to pull it out of the ground. Uh, I don't know what's harder, putting the core in or taking the core out. Both are very, very demanding. As you can see, we've got five, five guys here. And I mean, none of us are small guys by any means. And we're still struggling to get this core out of the ground. But when you do, you get something like this. You get left with a nice big tube. So this would be the top. This is the bottom. And so this would be my, more or less modern day. This is thousands of years ago. And then we can see, right, all these different vertical layers as it grow. And like, we can start to then compare about different things in the past. Where, was it a higher temperature? Was it higher sea level? What types of corals were going uh, and why and all these things. So once you pull the core out, we cut them in half. Uh, this is the top half of the core. This core, because it was too long, this is actually the core from the, the first picture here. We cut it in half to work with because it was over three meters long. It was about three and a half meters. Uh, so it was five, like over five meters in, three and a half out. So it's quite a long core, but you can see this is the top of the core. And you can see that it's, it's quite rubbly. This is all pieces of coral. Uh, you can see it's more white brown sand and it's very coarse sand. And then as we start to go down core, it gets more gray, more muddy. But you can still see, even though it's mud, there's still this is all coral that you're seeing there. This is coral, coral. This is all coral. So this core is mostly composed of coral framework with the sediment that infills it. And so now, like I said, then we have a history. We've got modern, we've got a couple thousand years ago, and we can really see how things have changed since then.
So we broke the core up into two size fractions. I spent three months in a room with no windows in the middle of Dutch winter sieving. So it was a really dark, onerous winter for me. Um, but I'm sure it was worth it in the end, even though I didn't see sunlight for three months. But what we did is we separated them into the large fraction, which is the corals, and the smaller fraction, we had to break them up, uh, in, which is basically the sediment that infills in it. And so this is an example of some of the, this is the top of a core, and these are the corals. So we can actually see, not only do we have beautiful corals that are preserved, but like, this is a, a galexia, these are a cropper, these are seriatoporos. These are corals that we can identify to this genera and species level. Here we've got some small gastropods, uh, so snails and um, clams. That's also a very important community. You can tell a lot about that. And then, you know, just other generic rubble that we can't get IDs. But still, I mean, we have some beautiful coral preservation, which is which is really great for us because it, it lets us use a lot of work. So now we have the samples and we want to look at how the reefs have changed over time. That means we need to do dating. And I don't mean dating like my love life. Uh, I'm pretty sure if we were to talk about that right now, my girlfriend would be upset. So we're going to just talk about dating in terms of radiocarbon dating, radiometric dating. So what we do is as these shells and corals uh, form from calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate has carbon in it, is one of the key components, and it incorporates this carbon from the water column. But it incorporates different isotopes of carbon. It incorporates carbon-14 and carbon-12 in certain ratios. And so once the animal dies, the carbon is preserved at those ratios and those ratios are dependent on a certain time. So what we can do then is we know, we know if there's more carbon-14, it's very young. If it's more carbon-12, it's very old. And so we burn a piece of the fossil and we measure the difference between the carbon-14 and the carbon-12 and that difference tells us how old it is. So we did that by using these mollusk shells, the snails and the clams. So you can see there's 45 of them that we took here for dates. Uh, why we ended up using the, the mollusks is because as you can see, this is, this is a snail shell from over three meters down a core and it ended up being about 6,300 years old. So even though it's over 6,000 years old, it still has all the colors. It's got the yellows, the whites, the browns. It has the ornamentation, these lovely little um, striations, as well as you can see, it still has that beautiful sheen that you'd have in normal life. So it just shows you that for even 6,300 years old, it's beautifully preserved. And that's why we use these because we know the better preserved a fossil is, the more accurate of date you're gonna be able to get from it. Uh, and then so after you take your dates, we can look at accretion rates, but of course we can also look at different organisms and groups and look at how they've changed and what that might tell us. So we've already talked about, we, we can use corals to grow and quantify reef growth. Uh, fish teeth have been used in a, to examine coral grazing, grazing sorry, and herbivory over time. Same with urchin spines. You can look at urchin grazing over reefs. Uh, sponge picules. Sponge picules are a siliceous microscopic component that sponges produce, and they produce them in thousands. And that's what their skeleton is. It's just a bunch of these. It's like fiberglass. They pack all these very fine silica fibers together to make a skeleton. But we can use them because they're so unique. You can see they come in different shapes and, and sizes. We can use them to identify changes in the different sponge communities. Of course, we have these foraminifera, as we talked about, these foram, these single-celled organisms. They're also very useful because they live in very specific uh, environments and habitats. So certain forams live on sandy bottoms, certain forams live on corals, certain forams live on seagrasses. Uh, they live in certain specific water depths. So by looking at the forams, you can tell, you know, was this more corals? Was it more sandy? Was it more seagrass? Like what was what was the reef environment dominated by at this point in time, as well as the little bit idea of water depth. Uh, but for my project, we focus on just the corals, the sponges, and the forums, because these are my three taxonomic groups of specialty. Um, and as well as with, you know, the, the fish and the urchin spines, these, this data was done in the Caribbean, where there's a lot less species. And it, to do that in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific would take someone who is a very, very specific expert on urchins and fish, which I am not. So we, we don't look at those groups. So I just want to kind of go a little bit over the results of what we got with the dating. Um, so basically, this is the first island, Samalona, that one that's closer to shore. So this is the island itself, and this is that reef flat inner reef. This would be the reef crest, this black line, and the darker green is the reef slope. We took five cores from across this reef flat, going west, east to west, because obviously, like I say, the, the, the platform, the island's on the east, and it goes out towards the west, as well as the wind direction comes from the west into the east. And then we took three cores from the slope. So these are some of my uh, preliminary results that we're going to talk about here. So what we have is the, the reef flat, the inner reef. The tops of the cores are zero to just over a thousand years, which tells us it's more or less modern. Um, right at the front of the island, the core is about four thousand years on the top. Well, that kind of makes sense. 
but the island would have been filled up before the middle part of the right. The the, the, the reef would have built from the edges inward, especially as we say with the wind and wave energy, the, the sediment pushes from west to east. So of course the island built up first on the east side. And right here in front of the reef crest is also quite old, 6,700 years. But again, that makes sense. The reef crest would have been the first thing to touch sea level. But what's really interesting we see is once you drop down a meter or two, you go from you know a thousand years or less to suddenly six thousand years, seven thousand years. So we have in two to three meters of core, we have only a thousand years or less represented, and in the very top meter of core, we have six thousand years of time. So what we're seeing is really rapid growth from seven thousand to six thousand years, and then the very slow growth afterwards on the reef flat. The reef slope is a little bit different. Uh, you know, we see only a couple thousand years in the bottom, but still modern on the top. But that's to be expected. As you can see, this is the water depth, right? There's still plenty of room for the reef to grow both, uh, corals to grow both vertically and horizontally on the reef slope. So of course they're younger because they're still growing actively. Whereas on the reef flat, we don't see very much coral today because it's too shallow, uh, it's too warm, etc. Uh, this is Kuden around KK. So KK is the island that's further offshore and it's more wave energy dominated as opposed to turbid zone dominated. But similarly, we took four cores from across the uh, reef flat inner reef. Uh, this one's a little bit off the transect because this was very difficult to core through. It was very cemented and very hard. So we had to try and find a spot. Uh, and of course, we also took three cores from the reef slope as well. Then we took one core here on the island itself. So this part of the island is a spit that actually moves direction depending on the monsoon season. So when the monsoons comes, it moves that way. And then when the monsoons recede, it moves this way, as well as it floods and unfloods. So sometimes it's above water, sometimes it's not. So we're interested to see if anything interesting happens with all this reworking on this part of the island. Uh, spoiler alert, it's all reworking and it's actually very difficult to get any useful information out of it. But, you know, it just kind of proved what we already knew that it's a very reworked part of uh, the reef island form. So similarly, we see right on the cross the reef flat, we've got, you know, zero to only a couple hundred years on the top of the core, and you drop down a meter and suddenly it's 6,000, 7,000 years again. Our reef slope, of course, is also much younger, but again, it's got plenty of room to actually grow both vertically and horizontally. So we're not surprised that we're seeing younger dates on the reef slope. But this is really quite interesting. So both islands have the exact same pattern. So what could this mean? Why are we getting really rapid growth from 7,000 years to 6,000 years, and then almost no growth afterwards in, in the 6,000 years until present day? Well, so this is a sea level curve. So if zero is the relative sea level today, the zero line, we see that 10,000 years ago, sea level is actually over 30 meters shallower than it is now. So between 10,000 years and 6,000 years, the coral reef, or sorry, the sea level in, in the Indonesia area has gone up over 30 meters in that time span. So it's been amazingly rapid uh, sea level rise. And then from that point onwards, it's been declining very slowly until the present day. Uh, it's not represented in this graph because of several factors, but in the present day sea level is starting to rise again. It would be at just above zero now. But so what we're seeing kind of makes sense, right? We're talking about how we go from zero to 6,000 years. Also what we're seeing is 7,000 to 6,000 years, the coral reef islands are forming super rapidly to keep up or catch up with the sea level rise. And once they do manage to catch up, then suddenly the sea level, not only does it become static, it actually drops and there's no more room for them to grow, which explains this, this very slow rate we've seen in the last 6,000 years. Uh, like I said, accommodation space is important. So if there's no more room for the corals to grow. It can only grow as corals die and then it can infill the space of a dead coral. But otherwise there's no more room for it to grow vertically without extra sea level rise or some sort of a mortality event. And so that actually explains a lot, which makes sense. And so what we can do then is we kind of pitch a model of island growth. So all these islands grow basically the same. You get a reef platform that grows up from the bottom of the surface. Uh, on the western side, you start to get a bit of this reef crest formation. The east side, there's not really a reef crest in the modern day. But we didn't take cores on the east side, so we take that with a grain of salt. But then, right, so you get most of this reef growth from 7,000 to 6,000 years. I mean, the reef crest basically is already touching the, the, the surface of the ocean as sea level rise starts to uh, peter off and then actually decline. And like I said, we have wave energy and wind energy from west to east, so it pushes. Once we have this barrier here, all the sediments trapped on the platform gets pushed from west to east and forms an island on the east side of the platform. As we move to the last couple hundred years, the island's already fully emerged as well as, like I said, there's no more room on the reef crest. There's no more room really for vertical growth. It can only grow on the reef slope, a little bit horizontally and vertically, and then a little bit of infilling in this last meter or so on the reef flat, which is what we see in the present day. But again, that's, it tracks with the sea level. And so that, that tells us actually as well that we saw extreme sea level rise. We saw over 35 meters in just 4,000 years. And so it tells us that 
that corals in the area, as long as sea level doesn't exceed this kind of rapid growth, and as well as corals don't face other major declines, the corals in, in Indonesia are very well able to catch up and keep up with sea level rise in the future, uh, except for all but the worst extreme scenarios that we see in the IPCC reports. But as long as they don't exceed these levels, which we saw were already quite rapid in, in the, the start of the Holocene, these corals will be able to keep up with sea level rise in the future. And of course, like I said, we've also quantified our corals. Um, the data I'm still working on, but nothing fun to visualize, but I want to just show you. So this is a piece of Pasolopora from 4,500 years ago. And this is a piece of Dipsastrea from 6,000 years ago. So it just shows that even, even for 4,500, 6,000 years, we have well-preserved corals that we can identify to the genus, if not species, species level. Uh, and as well, this is important because Pasolopora is a common coral in the Indo-Pacific. It's actually also a very, uh, what we call like a weedy coral. It's a survivalist. It can survive under many conditions. So so seeing what happened with Pasolopora in the past is going to be useful to see what would happen with it in the future. And this one's interesting because this is one of those massive corals, one of those ones that can grow for hundreds of years. Uh, so we managed to put a core through this giant, what we call a boiled coral, which is impressive in itself. And it literally is the full diameter of the, the tube. But it's also nice because it lets us look at some of these massive corals in the past and also see them, um, what were massive corals doing and how can they respond to different scenarios of, of climate change, past and present and future. We also have some sponge spicule data that's coming in. So these are some sponge spicules like I talked about. There's these silica produced structures that sponges make and they make them in the thousands and they bundle them together and that's how they make a skeletal structure. Uh, but what's interesting about all these is these spicules I put up here are examples of spicules from what are called excavating sponges. So these are sponges that can eat away at calcium carbonate like those from coral skeletons, whether they're living or dead. So they, they use acids and they use like mechanical force and they break apart the calcium carbonate and they actually use it uh, partly as a food source. And what we see actually in these cores is, as we move from past to present, we're seeing a lot more of these spicules from, from these excavating sponges. So we're seeing a lot more of these sponges that are eroding away at corals and calcium carbonate, which could be indicating actually an overall decline in reef health on these reefs. It's basically saying that corals can no longer outcompete sponges and sponges are starting to, to catch up and outcompete them. Uh, this is all work that's being done by my master's student, Kiri. Uh, she's just wrapping up her project actually this month, so we should hopefully have the sponge data coming along quite soon. And finally, we also have four amps coming from the cores. Again, like I said, these are single-celled organisms that produce a calcium carbonate test or shell. Uh, but like I said, so what specifically what they do is these these are Epstegina. This is this type of four amp that prefers corals. And what we see is on the KK, the island that's further out, we see a lot more of these Epstegina's, whereas we see more types of four amps on Samalona, the island that's in the turbid zone, that prefer sandy bottoms. And so we do see a difference in the form community between the islands, and then we're hopefully seeing that maybe if we can see some shifts throughout the past to the present, see what happens there. Uh, but again, this is work that's being done by another master student, Sai, who's also wrapping up this month. So this data is is also incoming. But but just a little insight to what we're doing besides just looking at reef growth and formation. Okay, and I guess we're getting towards the end here. But I just want to say. Uh, obviously, just as one single coral we learned does not make an island, one man also is not an island. I, I cannot thank enough, especially our Indonesian colleagues, uh, especially TR and Mazdar. These two alone are more responsible for coring than even myself, even though it's my project. Without them, we wouldn't have a single meter of core. Uh, so, you know, them, as well as anyone else who put in a meter of core, all of our local Indonesian collaborators, uh, they did so much good work for us. I cannot thank them enough. I, I honestly, I don't know where to begin with that, but... Of course, also my coral taxonomy guru, Dr. Baird Hoeksema here in the Netherlands. He's taught me so much about Indo-Pacific corals these last few months. Uh, my my lab, master students who are working in the forms of spicules, lab techs, uh, anyone who's worked in this project in any fashion. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of these kinds of projects. Is these I'm, I'm on an EU-funded ITN grant, so we're a large project. We're a consortium across 18, 18 PhDs, across 40, 40 people, across, I think, 13 different institutions. So, you know, just... Just internal gratitude for anyone who's caused this project any success. And so like that, with that, uh, we can get to discussion if anyone might have some questions. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Sure. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, now's the time. Uh, I'll turn off recording for this part, just so we feel free to ask any questions, even if they feel a bit silly. <laughs> I know why no such thing as a silly question. That's what I've learned doing a PhD. Yeah. <laughs>